To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. The tension between conformity and individuality is an ever-present issue for human beings. Whether we are 12, 20 or 40, we always have to negotiate our personal peculiarities with the demands and pressures of society. This is not an easy task, because we have to manage the balancing act of neither becoming a tragic misfit nor degenerating into a superficial shell of our true self. Today, we look at this practical problem from the perspective of some of the finest minds of the 20th century. By filling in the gaps of time, we may get some guidance on how to conduct ourselves in today's world. In psychology, the interplay of social forces and the individual psyche are an important factor for health and pathology. When we are alone, we behave differently than when we are with other people. Sometimes these differences can be so pronounced as if they would account for two separate individuals. Carl Jung called the mode of being which people switch on when they are surrounded by others the persona. Persona is originally the mask that the actor wore and which denoted the role in which the player appeared. So whenever we appear on the stage of social conduct, we hide behind the mask of socializing. But why do we have to hide behind such a mask? What do we hide and what do we show? It is a mask that feigns individuality, that makes others and oneself believe that one is individual, when in fact it is only an acted role. Basically, the persona is nothing real. It is a compromise between the individual and the society about what one appears to be. It takes on a name, acquires a title, represents an office and is this or that. This is of course real in a certain sense, but in relation to the individuality of the person concerned, it is like a secondary reality. A mere compromise in which others are sometimes even more involved than oneself. The persona is an appearance, a two-dimensional reality. But why do we have to conceal our true self when we face other human beings? Can't we simply come together as individuals, showing our very nature? Jung vehemently disagrees. The persona on the one hand is calculated to make a certain impression on others and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. That the latter is superfluous can only be claimed by those who are so identical with their persona that they no longer know themselves. And that the former is unnecessary can only be imagined by those who are unaware of the true nature of their fellow human beings. So essentially, Jung argues that human nature is not made for harmless chit-chat and peaceful cooperation. Whatever darkness lies dormant within the human nature seems to be so grave that we have to put on a mask to be socially acceptable. A glance at human history corroborates this dark take on human nature. After all, every atrocity of the past was committed by human beings. Assuming a qualitative difference between oneself and the perpetrators of historical mayhem is not so much a testament to personal virtue, but to profound ignorance. So as human beings, we are well advised to come up with a mask that enables an intact social order. If we would shed our mask and meet in plain individuality, our society would be ripped into pieces. Or as Jung writes, the society expects, indeed must expect, every individual to play the role assigned to him as perfectly as possible. That means that someone who is a pastor not only performs his official function objectively, but also plays the role of pastor all the time and under all circumstances without objection. The society demands this as a kind of security. Everyone must stand in their place. One is a shoemaker, the other is a poet. He is not expected to be both, nor is it advisable to be both. Such a person would be different from other people, not entirely reliable. It seems that we are indeed like actors in a play most of the time. We adhere to an implicit script and remain within the spaces of our assigned roles. Society is a carefully orchestrated drama that necessitates meticulous conduct and a great deal of conformity. Considering the darkness behind the mask, these rigid requirements seem well founded. Betrayal of this conformity therefore invites irritation and disapproval. Those who do not play by the rules flirt with the danger of becoming outcasts. However, human beings cannot only exist in the mode of the persona. After all, we are individuals who need to express their individual personality. There needs to be a delicate balance between individuality and conformity. 
If this homeostasis is disturbed, pathology emerges. Or, as Jung writes, in terms of individuality, of course, no one could be completely absorbed by these expectations. Which is why the construction of an artificial personality becomes unavoidably necessary. The demands of decency and good manners do the rest to motivate a wholesome mask. Behind the mask what is called a private life then emerges. This well-known separation of consciousness into two often ridiculously different figures is a crucial psychological operation that cannot remain without consequences for the unconscious. One of these consequences can be that one's individuality becomes lost completely. Some people are so absorbed within playing their role in the collective drama of society that they confuse their mask with their individual personality. As shallow ghosts they haunt the stage, carving out a miserable existence as two-dimensional beings. The construction of a collectively fitting persona means a huge concession to the outside world. A true self-sacrifice that forces the ego straight into an identification with the persona, so that there really are people who believe that they are what they represent. These identifications with the social role are generally fertile sources of neurosis. The shallowness of the collective drama of the persona was acutely observed by the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Heidegger claims that on a daily basis people are not themselves. They are an impersonal agent, which is not called persona, but the they. This impersonal they is the mode of being which people manifest in their daily lives most of the time. For example, we can think something is good, right, wrong or outrageous, simply because people think it is good, right, wrong or outrageous. Opinions about this can be found on the street, in the press, on radio and television, in advice centers, public offices, in trendy pubs and at regular tables. In short, in every kind of public sphere. This they is the way of being of everyday existence, which identifies itself through generally available norms and values. The institutional mode of being consists of a leveling of all individuality to the average. Or as Heidegger writes, everyone is the other and no one is himself. The they, which supplies the answer to the question of the who of everyday being, is the nobody, to whom every human being has already surrendered itself in being among one another. Existence in the mode of the they is so seductive because it means nothing other than the relief of the burden of existence. The human being does not have to consider what to think about everything and everyone. The they comes to meet it and take the burden off its shoulders. Not existing as an individual but in the mode of the they bears a few characteristic features. For example, a they does not engage in discourse but in what Heidegger calls idle talk. Idle talk refers to all institutionalized forms of speech such as empty phrases, buzzwords, fashionable topics, certain popular expressions and so on. In short, everything that can follow the route of gossiping and passing the word along. What is said in idle talk as such spreads in wider circles and takes on an authoritative character. Things are so because they say so. Everything that is said is characterized by self-evidence that renders any personal understanding superfluous. Idle talk is the possibility of understanding everything without prior appropriation of the matter. The second feature of impersonal conduct as they is curiosity. This is a technical term and does not cover everything that we usually associate with the word. The curiosity of the they is lingering in the world, never dwelling anywhere. It concerns itself with seeing, not in order to understand what is seen, but just in order to see. It seeks novelty only in order to leap from it anew to another novelty. By virtue of this curiosity, the human being attempts to withdraw from the world through distraction. Curiosity is thus the opposite of philosophical amazement, which remains with the thing precisely because it does not understand. Curiosity is restless, it is everywhere and nowhere. As Heidegger writes, it concerns itself with the kind of knowing just in order to have known. It is interesting how these two features of the they work together. For example, idle talk controls the ways in which you may be curious. It says what you must have read and seen. Either of these ways to be drags the other one with it. Curiosity for which is nothing closed off and idle talk for which there is nothing that is not understood provide themselves with the guarantee of a life, which supposedly is genuinely lively. 
How can we escape this shallow mode of existence? In cherishing our individuality. One thinker who celebrated individuality as the highest value of humanity is Ralph Waldo Emerson. He had a profound impact on Friedrich Nietzsche and wrote the epochal essay Self-Reliance. Emerson critiqued that people distrust their instincts and live in hostility to their individual drives. Instead, they make themselves a home in the comforts of society and collective dwelling, denying every thought that leaves the womb of community and wanders into the depth of individual pursuit. Emerson writes, A man should learn to detect and watch the gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Yet, he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. The problem is that from this inner gleam of light emerges everything that can be considered exceptional. Most of cultural progress is fueled by people who follow their idiosyncratic ideas and individual sentiments. These are the very ingredients for greatness and innovation. In every work of genius we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. The point is not that only some individuals are special and capable of extraordinary creation. Everyone has this inner gleam of light, but few pay attention to it. Even worse, most people reject their idiosyncrasies. They want to blend in with the herd and are afraid to stick out with their individual thoughts and ideas. Or, as Emerson writes, we but half express ourselves and are ashamed of that divine idea which each of us represents. Emerson reminds us that this self-denial comes at a price. Either we express our individual sentiments, or else tomorrow a stranger will say with masterly good sense precisely what we have thought and felt at the time, and we shall be forced to take with shame our own opinion from another. How can we learn to cherish this divine idea that is unique for every person? There is a state in which most people used to channel their individual sentiments in their childhood. Children are not so much concerned with the judgment of society. While not immune to these forces, they are yet absorbed within their own world. As inhabitants of their dreamlike kingdom, they behave with a corresponding entitlement. A boy is in the parlor what the pit is in the playhouse, independent, irresponsible, looking out from his corner on such people and facts as pass by. He tries and sentences them on their merits, in the swift, summary way of boys, as good, bad, interesting, silly, eloquent, troublesome. He cumbers himself never about consequences, about interests. He gives an independent, genuine verdict. However, in the course of enculturation, this state of self-reliance often becomes lost. Soon, the boy starts to become aware of the pressure to conform to societal standards. But the man is, Emerson continues, clapped into jail by his consciousness. As soon as he has once acted or spoken with the car, he is a committed person, watched by the sympathy or the hatred of hundreds, whose affection must now enter into his account. Now, the spark of individuality is observed with increasing distrust. The individual has learned that following this drive might alienate the people around. The voices of unique idiosyncrasy might be interesting, but they put our social acceptability at stake. This is where we start to ignore them until they eventually begin to fade. Emerson writes, these are the voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. So, to use Heidegger's words, we enter the land of the they. Here, we have to bow before the reign of etiquette and manners. Everyone is the other and no one is himself. In order to enjoy the merits of a shared life, we have to sacrifice a major part of our individuality, but we sacrifice it on the altar of life in community. Society is a joint stock company, in which the members agree, for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder, to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most requests is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Shall we therefore suspend our individuality in favor of a life surrounded by society? Emerson's call to individuality remains unabated. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. But how can we preserve our individuality 
our divine inner gleam of light without going insane in the face of social pressures of conformity. Building a persona is a healthy and necessary part of personal development. To develop a stronger persona might feel inauthentic, like learning to play a role, but if one cannot perform a social role, then one will suffer. Without it, we are doomed misfits in an alienating environment. For most people, this is a fate unworthy of discussion. Human beings are social creatures, and we depend on interpersonal bonds to others, whether we like it or not. Choosing the path of the outcast might make a romantic fantasy, but in most cases, it remains a delusion. Leaving society means to cut the umbilical cord of well-being. At the same time, we cannot abandon our individuality and identify completely with our persona. As Jung said, this would provide fertile ground for neurosis. So how do we escape this dilemma? The reconciliation of our individuality and the oppressive forces of society is a part of the process of individuation, which is the overall objective of Jungian psychotherapy. Jung describes this process like this. The aim of individuation is nothing less than to divest the self of the false wrappings of the persona on the one hand and the suggestive power of primordial images on the other. How can we enter this process which integrates these opposing drives? Reynolds suggests the following. One goal for individuation is for the people to develop a more realistic, flexible persona that helps them navigate in society but does not collide with nor hide their true self. Eventually, in the best case, the persona is appropriate and tasteful, a true reflection of our inner individuality and our outward sense of self. This means that we can actively participate in the process of building a personality. Having a persona is necessary to survive within society, but the greater the difference between our character and the persona, the more pathology arises as a consequence. If we remain ignorant of this difference, we become a puppet controlled by external forces of life. As Jung writes, without realizing it, the conscious personality is pushed onto the chessboard of an invisible player as one piece among others. And it is this player who decides the game of fate, not the conscious mind and its intention. So how can we remain in control of our game of chess and avoid becoming a pawn in the hands of alien forces? The author Hermann Hesse has explored this question in a vivid scene of the novel The Steppenwolf. Towards the end, the main character has some sort of psychedelic trip in which he enters a magical theater. The theater consists of many different rooms. On one of the doors it says, guidance in the building up of the personality. Success guaranteed. He enters and describes the following. I found myself in a quiet twilight room where a man with something like a large chessboard in front of him sat in eastern fashion on the floor. He held a glass up to me and I saw the unity of my personality broken up into many selves. The pieces were now very small, about the size of chessmen. The player took a dozen or so of them in his sure and quiet fingers and placed them on the ground near the board. As he did so, he began to speak in the monotonous way of one who goes through a recitation or reading that he has often gone through before. The mistaken and unhappy notion that a man is an enduring unity is known to you. It is also known to you that man consists of a multitude of souls, of numerous selves. The separation of the unity of the personality into these numerous pieces passes for madness. Science has invented the name schizomania for it. Science is in so far right as no multiplicity may be dealt with unless there be a series, a certain order and grouping. It is wrong in so far as it holds that one only and binding and lifelong order is possible for the multiplicity of subordinate selves. In consequence of this error many persons pass for normal and indeed for highly valuable members of society who are incurably mad and many, on the other hand, are looked upon as mad who are geniuses. Hence it is that we supplement the imperfect psychology of science by the conception that we call the art of building up the soul. We demonstrate to anyone whose soul has fallen to pieces that he can rearrange these pieces of a previous self in what order he pleases and so attain to an endless multiplicity of moves in the game of life. As the playwright shapes a drama from a handful of characters, so do we, from the pieces of the disintegrated self, build up ever new groups with ever new interplay and suspense and new situations that are eternally inexhaustible. Look, with the sure and silent touch of his clever fingers, he took hold of my pieces, 
all the old men and young men, and children and women, cheerful and sad, strong and weak, nimble and clumsy, and swiftly arranged them on his board for a game. At once they formed themselves into groups and families, games and battles, friendships and enmities, making a small world. For a while he let this lively and yet orderly world go through its evolutions, before my enraptured eyes in play and strife, making treaties and fighting battles, wooing, marrying and multiplying. It was indeed a crowded stage, a moving breathless drama. Then he passed his hand swiftly over the board and gently swept all pieces into a heap, and meditatively with an artist's skill made up a new game of the same pieces, with quite other groupings, relationships and entanglements. The second game had an affinity with the first. It was the same world built of the same material, but the key was different. The time changed, the motive was differently given out and the situations differently presented. And in this fashion the clever architect built up one game after another, out of the figures each of which was a bit of myself and every game had a distant resemblance to every other. Each belonged recognizably to the same world and acknowledged a common origin, yet each was entirely new. This is the art of life, he said dreamily. You may yourself as an artist develop a game of your life and lend it animation. You may complicate and enrich it as you please. It lies in your hands. Just as madness, in a higher sense, is the beginning of all wisdom, so is schizomania the beginning of all art and all fantasy. I wish you much pleasure, my dear sir.